Hello, I'm so thankful that you can join me for Rejoice in the Lord. This is Positive Christian Living as we're studying through the book of Philippians. Today in this lesson, we're in chapter 4, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 9. Before we get there, I just want to briefly go over what we've learned so far in this letter. If you remember, Paul in chapter 1 begins to offer a prayer of thanksgiving and a quick blessing on behalf of the Philippians. He loves this church very much, and he is so thankful for their continued support and their participation in the gospel. He also briefs them on the situation and the opportunities that he's had to spread the gospel, even in the middle of being in trouble and in prison in Rome. He shares with them that he wanted to be with Christ, but he also wanted to keep on living and continue his work in ministry. He's in this great dilemma. Remember what he says, for me to live is Christ, for me to die is gain. And then he gives them some personal exhortations and encourages them to keep believing in this system of salvation by faith and not on the system of keeping a certain law in order to be saved. Remember, he talks about true circumcision and false circumcision and makes the comparison about those two things, telling them not to have confidence in the flesh, but have confidence in Christ. He explains that the positive mature Christian is one who stands firm in the faith and is not easily moved by these false teachers who are these Judaizers. He tells them that he wants them to imitate Christ uh, by being humble and by looking out for the interest of others and not necessarily for their own interest. Remember what he says, have this attitude in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Then he begins to tell them to rejoice in trials knowing that through those trials that they will be able to grow in their faith. He tells them that seeking righteousness by faith in Jesus is way better than trying to seek righteousness by following a set of rules or regulations or traditions. It is in this final chapter that Paul talks about the positive, mature Christian and how he is one who demonstrates a certain lifestyle. Paul will then close this letter in chapter 4 with this greeting and a blessing and giving them the final words of encouragement to live positive, Christian, righteous lives. In this lesson today, like I said, we're going to look at verses 1 through 9, and we're going to see how the positive Christian not just strives to be righteous, but lives righteous. He accomplishes this by showing three ways that the positive Christians live their lives. Number one, positive Christians live righteously by living in harmony. Let's look at the text together. He says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and my crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. I urge Euodia and I urge Synthike to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true companion. I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement and also the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are written in the book of life. I want you to first notice how, how much Paul loves these brothers and these sisters. He uses this term beloved two times in one sentence. Notice that he says that he longs to see them. Notice that he uses words uh, of endearment or terms of endearment like joy and my crown. He loves this church. And then he tells them and he encourages them to stand firm in the Lord. That's verse one. Paul seems to really love this church. They are very dear to him. And so with that in mind, because he loves them so much, he sees it as a perfect opportunity to tell them about a specific situation that he wants corrected. And he addresses a little bit of discord that's going on between two sisters. Now, I want you to notice that this discord is not at the church level, like there's this group over here in this church, and then there's this group over here in this church. But this discord is between two sisters in Christ. And really, Paul is encouraging both sisters to make changes when he urges them to live in harmony in the Lord. Isn't it interesting 
that in verse 3, there's this term, true companion. And it's almost like Paul is addressing a specific person. And it's interesting that that word, that Greek word there, can actually be translated into a proper name for a gentleman. So maybe he's addressing this man whose name means true companion. Whatever the case is, he appeals to this person to help these women to find peace with one another, since they will be, since they have always lived faithful as servants in the past, and that their names are written in the book of life. They need to live in peace. Paul does not want this dispute to grow and to fester and produce a worse situation for the church, which really could lead to to eternal consequences for those two sisters. Paul recalls a time when they and another brother, Clement, worked together in harmony with him and other disciples. And this really helps us to see that if we, when we deal with discord or we deal with disagreements or confrontation with each other, if we'll all just get busy in the work and the kingdom of God, trying to grow it and evangelize, well, then there won't be much time for bickering and discord. Let's get to work in the kingdom. You see, because positive Christians living in righteousness, sure, we have disagreements with each other from time to time, but we don't let those times define and destroy the bond of fellowship and keep us from the work that needs to be done in the kingdom. Paul further explains in Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 1 through 3 the importance of maintaining unity in the church. Notice what Paul says. He says, Therefore I, a prisoner of the Lord, employ you to walk uh, in a worthy manner of the calling in which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness and patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, he reminds that church who they are and what is expected of them if they're going to be disciples. He tells them that they've been called to live as he lived and to pursue maturity in Christ. Also, I want you to notice the attitudes and the virtues that are necessary to maintain peace and unity among those who have been forgiven and who are set for eternal life. You know, these situations are not resolved by force. When there's an argument or discord or dis- or disagreements or confrontation, we can't force people to get along. No, we've got to work at it generally. We've got to be careful with it and realize that the goal in a dispute is not to win an argument where one group or one sister defeats another sister and the other one is victorious. No, to maintain unity is what the true goal is while we work out our differences. It does not matter whose fault it is nor what the issue is. What matters is that it is resolved and that unity is maintained. That's what Paul is telling these sisters. And I think it's interesting that Achieving this requires all parties involved to be positive, mature Christians who are living in righteousness. Those virtues are gentleness and patience and compromise and tolerance and love and not being so self-willed where it's your way or the highway. No, it's not to be that way. It also requires, according to Ephesians 4 and verse Three, it requires being diligent to work in unity. It's going to take it's going to take people working hard in gentleness and patience and compromise and tolerance and love and not being so self willed. Not my interest, but your interest. Number two, positive Christians are who are living righteously are going to live in confidence. Notice verse 4 through 7 in the text. Back in, back in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4 through 7. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. 
Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the God of peace, and the peace of God, will, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What a comforting passage. And it's helpful as we go through this to maybe work in reverse order as we understand what it means to have this great confidence. You see, positive, mature Christians living in righteousness, we need to have confidence by not bragging or, or trash talking or showing off, but positive Christian uh, Christians who are living in righteousness, they build confidence by rejoicing and trusting in the Lord. That's what actually is going to build confidence. It's finding confidence in the peace that God gives us. Now notice as we work through this in reverse order, as we look at it from verse 7 and then go back into verse 6, notice that it begins with prayer, that you're going to pray uh, and that's how you're going to get the peace that he offers to us. Very end of verse 6, we are to pray with thanksgiving. And then that is what's going to lead us to not being anxious for anything. And it ends with us rejoicing. That makes sense to us, doesn't it? We pray, we offer thanksgiving, we find ourselves not being anxious anymore, and therefore we rejoice. This confidence all leads up to what we find in verse 7, the peace from God, peace of emotion and really peace of mind. What a beautiful thing. This occurrence happens because no matter what happens in our life, we find peace with Christ, with God. And positive Christians know that our resurrection and eternal life are granted through Jesus Christ. That gives us great confidence. No matter what's going on in our lives, we know that the worst thing that can happen to a Christian, well, it's not to die because even if we were to die, it is gain, according to Paul. Confidence and peace are therefore based on faith. Not numbers, not based upon a person, not on things. That's a positive Christian, one who is living in confidence. Number three, positive Christians who are living righteously live in purity. Look at verses eight through nine with me. Paul says, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Paul is putting forth the effort to equip the Philippians with positive, mature Christian living. So what does he do? He provides for them a spiritual test. If they think this way, then they will determine that they are positive Christians. So do they think and say things that are positive? Do they do things that are positive? Well, if that's the case, then you are a positive Christian. Paul then provides for himself as a role model. He says, look to see how he behaved, and then they are to do the same. It is a practice test that leads the positive Christian to determine if they're living righteously. Let's make application today for us. Are you living in harmony? You see, the positive Christian does. They live in harmony. And if there's confrontation, if there's discord, if there's disagreements and conflict between you and a brother or you and a sister, that needs to be resolved. Don't be pointing fingers trying to find blame. Don't, don't try to determine whose fault it is. Don't worry so much about that. Find harmony so that you can live with Christ as a positive Christian in unity with each other and with Christ. Are you living in confidence? Sure, we may have anxiety at times, 
But are you praying to find the peace that you need with thanksgiving in your heart? Which leads to you rejoicing? You see how that works? If you will live in confidence, you find yourself rejoicing in the Lord. Because you're praying and not having the anxiety that you once had. And that gives us the great confidence that we find in Jesus Christ. That's where we find peace, isn't it? You want to be peaceful? Live in confidence, rejoicing in the Lord. Let me ask you this. Are you living in purity? Are all the things that you think, all the things that you do, all the things that you say, pure things? See, the the positive Christian, that's what he's doing. He's going to look for ways that he can say what is positive, do what is positive, and think what is positive. What are those things? Well, it might be honorable, right, pure, lovely, good repute, excellent, worthy of praise. Those are the things that the positive Christian thinks, says, and does. If you follow that test, then you're living a positive Christian life in righteousness. You're living in harmony. You're living in confidence. You're living in purity. Well, thank you so much for joining me today for Rejoice in the Lord, Positive Christian Living as we're studying through the book of Philippians. Next time, we will conclude chapter four and really the entire book with just some closing remarks from Paul. And it really helps us to see this great positive life that we can live. God bless you and I hope you have a wonderful day. Keep studying the word.